Again, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining. This is Serving User Generated Content on a Global Scale by Pedro Porenza and myself, Matthias Hutter. Um, we're going to talk today about 10 practices or tips or ideas that we learned when building our media service called Apollo. Right now, we're ramping up glo globally. We are in a couple of countries that are like serving. We're getting to most of them over the next couple of months. But before we actually start, I'd like to know of you who does know OLX. And I don't mean who has seen a lot of people running around with that T-shirt. <laughs> who, who has heard of OLX before? There's actually wow. more people than We did a lot of recruiting here, right? <laughs> so OLX is, or the OLX group actually, is a global classifieds company. We are basically, dealing, we're basically trying to connect users to sell previously used goods to each other. If you don't know us, you might know companies like Craigslist in the US or Gumtree, eBay Kleinanzeigen here in Germany. Russians might know one of our businesses called Avito. We're doing the same thing. Um, did I mention Gumtree? In any case, <laughs> classifieds. Besides that, we also have a couple of more specialized experiences around real estate and previously used cars. And we're actually quite big. The reason why most of you haven't heard of us, I guess, is because we're focusing on potential high growth markets in the future. We're investing a bit more long term into markets that will hopefully grow to a crazy size within the next couple of years. Mostly of them are in Asia, so we're big in India and big in Indonesia, but we're also quite present in Eastern Europe, quite a household name in Poland or the Ukraine. We do a lot in Africa, where this company actually comes from, and a lot in Latin America. We are quite big, I think. Um, by that time, you might already realize, but we are present in way over 40 markets. Um, the company itself has over 4,000 employees that work around the world in 25 offices. As most of you might be developers here, I guess. Um, I can't tell you the number of developers because I don't know it. But I checked our GitHub, and there is 500 registered people in our GitHub. And I assume most of them <laughs> have something to do with software engineering. Um, for development, our most important offices are in Berlin, in Buenos Aires, in Delhi, and in Lisbon, as well as in Poznan, in Poland. Looking at our scale of business, we're talking around 300 million monthly unique u um, users. That is pretty much close to Twitter. The 300 million monthly, unique, um, monthly active users are numbers that were reported last year publicly. So I can only tell you that number, but those numbers are 10 months old and we've grown quite a bit since then. So by now maybe we are a bit bigger than Twitter. Maybe not, <laughs> I can't tell. Um, 80 million of them are selling something on one of our websites each month. Thank you. So we're gonna be uh, talking specifically about one of our services we have. So here in Berlin we have an office and our office is mostly like 100% tech, let's say. We have some product managers, but they're mostly around our services, right? And images is what we're gonna talk about, why? So just to give you, before I jump into that, just to give you some other perspective, 300 million active users, that is like more than, it's the population of the United States, something like that. Or if you multiply the population of Berlin 100 times, and that not only not, it's okay, it's, I can just throw around numbers, but it's actually a big challenge, right? It's not just 300 million people. <laughs> it's a lot of challenges. And 18 million posting things or trying to sell things, one of the things is images. Images, when you want to sell something, is a first class citizen in the platform. And when you take a picture, you just don't take one, you take multiple, right? If you sell a car, you just don't take a picture of the car. You take multiple pictures. And some of them are fake for sure, because the car is broken. I don't know. It sometimes happens. So, oh. You click here. right, yes. Yeah, I don't know all this stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> we're talking about 388 million images that we have in our service, right? Available globally. And it grows with a number of more than 100 million images per month. It's a lot. 
And you can already imagine the possibilities if you associate metadata with those images. There is a lot of things we can do with that. And that's amazing. Like, really. It's like a, if you just walked into a huge playground and someone says, do whatever you want. And you're like, this sounds weird, <laughs> but it's fun. And it's true. So this is where Apollo comes in. Uh, images, it's something that there is a lot to do around images. For example, when you resize an image, if you're selling an item, there is an item in the middle of the picture, right? And you don't want to resize the item, because if it's a book, then nobody can read what the book is saying, right? So what you do is you resize everything else except the object. And this requires some work. And also, for example, for us, images mean something. For computers, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a bunch of pixels together. It talks to the graphic card, and the graphic card goes like, hey, here is an image. And the computer's like, cool. Right? For us, there's a lot of more meaning in the images. There's depth, there's perception, there's so many things, honestly. It's insane. And centralizing this in one service is what helps us b bring that full potential so that we can harvest and build on top of it. So this is one of the first steps you do, is you find something, you isolate it, and then you make it grow, right? So the, work, the way it works is, we have there our friend John. John is really happy. I don't know why, but so he's there. And John is, let's say that he's in our platform, right? So he posts an ad with some media content, whatever it is, audio file, I don't know. So he posts it, and what happens is it goes directly to Apollo. So Apollo is the one that receives the content, right? So what then happens is you have Joanna, She's upside down. <laughs> it's a really bad joke. I, I have really weird humor. But <laughs> so, <laughs> Matthias told me this. I never knew before. So let's say, so you have Joanna. Joanna visits. Joanna's is John's sister, because they are very similar names. So Joanna visits. And what happens is, here's where it gets weird. First of all, we are in underdeveloped countries. So. The good thing here is that we have amazing internet, whatever, really fast. We can do whatever. We can download a video, legal, of course, very fast. But Joanna, if she is in India, she's not able to do that. And you have to take into account this. And when you operate at scale, this is one of the things you have to take into account. There's very, very, very niche situations that are not so niche when you go to big markets. So bandwidth is one. So Apollo, what it does also is it takes into account the device you're uploading or, receive, or checking the image in, and it tailors that out for you in terms of bandwidth, in terms of size, if the website wants a different size, right? So phones, laptops, they all have different needs. They work differently. But now, if you talk, so I was talking about the scale, we're talking about 30,000 requests per second. That's a lot. Like, really, if this was my salary, that was amazing. 30,000 euros per second, that I would be so happy. <laughs> so 388 million images. If everybody in the United States would take a picture and upload it to Apollo, it would still not make this number. It's a lot, really. <clears throat> 100 terabytes of data. So this is, is also related to how you store the image compressions, et cetera. 95% of these requests actually go to cache. So out of these 30,000, 95% goes to cache. And the thing about the cache is the cache is close to you. So if you're accessing it from, I don't know, Berlin, you will not go through United States and back, then Portugal, then around the world, then you go another loop. No, you actually connect to Berlin office, not our office, but <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <Should I say? laughs> so you actually connect to a server in Berlin, yeah. and that's how it works. And now yeah. I give it yeah. to Matthias. <laughs> Do we have somebody here from eBay? OK, by the way, guys. Going from Germany to the US to fetch an image to go back here, this is how you guys do it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So let's look about a couple of things that we do to scale up. 
as a preface, some of these things might seem trivial and very simple. Still want to repeat them because of them really ma matter and make sense. Um, and some of them might not at all make sense for you. Please don't blindly copy that. This is stuff that worked for us. Um, we're also not completely there in terms of scale where we want to be. So 30,000 requests per, per second for us is a beautiful start. Hopefully next month we'll have it doubled. And um, from then on, 10x by the next year. So this is like, we're still in ramping that thing up. Um, I thought we group it into two things. We're going to go first with some more technical things and then some cultural or actually behavioral things like things the team does in order to achieve that scale, which is super important as we figure out. Um, however, first I'd like to just, I thought it might be cool to just show you how about Apollo <coughs> works. So come up with, you know, an architecture diagram, it'd be like very simplified. Apollo is a bit more than that, but I guess you all want to know how this works in theory. So every request that comes in goes through Akamai, which is our global CDN. Um, Akamai is awesome in the sense that they have edge, like edge nodes absolutely everywhere. It's like tons, of, um, tons of mirrors around the world, even in countries such as Indonesia, which is for us a big market. You don't get a lot of um, CDN presence there. Nevertheless, for us, it's super important, and especially their internet connections are really bad. Um, that thing, it takes care of those 95% of requests approximately. But everything that goes through goes uh, to the Apollo Frontend Web App, classic Java Spring application, although Java 8 and um, Spring Boot. And then um, we use Sumber for resizing. Sumber is, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but Sumber is a quite a nice open source product that comes from Brazil, but it's also utilized by Wikipedia for resizing images and rasterizing images. Basically, it's a web service um, that does image processing. You give it a URL, the URL you encode the URL of the image to load, and then you parameterize what you want to do with it, like resize it, encode it as JPEG, encoding it, encode it as WebP, um, set quality parameter to 60 or 30 or 20 whatsoever, and then return it. And yeah, all the files that people upload get stored in a three bucket, which is quite nice because S3, as we all know, is a nice serverless product that scales quite nicely horizontally. In the latest version, apparently, um, it can go up to 20, 256 shards. Important with S3, if you ever store a lot of files, um, keep in mind that um, it's, it's important to turn around file names. So common prefixes or subdirectories are actually what make S3 behave, um, perform really poorly. The first four or five characters must be really unique and random so that it can actually utilize that for sharding. Otherwise, you end up having everything on the same shard. And performance of S3 is going to be really funny at best. Um, image is there. It's quite awesome for that because it scales horizontally beautiful. Um, but there's also, of course, some metadata that we're storing right now. Most especially, like, where is this file coming from? We have a lot of business, a lot of classified sites. Which site does this image belong to? When did we receive it? How long do we, gonna do we need to store it? There's a couple of legal requirements around that. Like, we have to store images for at least two years after we're uploaded. Because if police comes and there was something illegal, we need to be able to give that to police. All, all these kind of funny things that you get when you operate in a lot of countries. Um, and then we, we have a backend application which is just doing batch jobs, like cleaning up uh, images or files that we don't care for anymore or archiving them actually, what's our, doing batch imports and so on. We all, we're running all of this in a Kubernetes cluster, um, quite convenient, which brings me to practice number one, that is forget about servers. You know, coming from, at least, and at least when I grew up in IT, I was coming from this old school thinking of um, bare metal, right? We gotta have bare metal, and I mean, this is quite straightforward, right? We have Apollo frontend, so that's a server group. We're gonna have, let's say, five Apollo frontend servers. Then we're gonna split it out from Thumber. Thumber's gonna be, I guess, 10 servers, right? Or whatever number of servers, we're gonna give it 10 servers. Then, of course, we have backend, which also needs to be two servers of, for, high, for high availability. Then we go for RDS, or RDS doesn't really exist, but we're gonna go for MySQL in that case. So MySQL will have a master, it's gonna have a standby master because of if what happens if master fails and we'll have a couple of slaves. And that comes with a couple of um, limitations, I'd say. Um, first of all, you end up with a, couple, with a lot of servers and all of them being quite underutilized. And even if you're able to you know, exactly get the Thumber cluster or your Thumber server group to be exactly at 80% CPU utilization all of the time, Maybe your RAM sits there and idles and has nothing to do. So, I mean, yeah, of course, you utilize one part of the system, but still, you're underutilizing a lot of things. Looking at that instant, that uh, Apollo thing, actually, 
I think quite typically what happens is in summer we have a lot of CPU usage, um, and, but in the ball front for example, we do have like next to zero CPU utilization because all we do is wait for bytes over the network coming from database, coming from uploads, or coming from summer. So those two can, could in theory live perfectly with each other, but then in a classic old school ser server environment, we wouldn't do that because that comes with a lot of other problem and cannibalization, quite complex. Then of course all these server classes would be different and would be different to be set up. The Java applications need to JVM installed. Then we have um, Thumber, that's Python, and Thumber uses OpenCV. OpenCV is an awesome um, native uh, C um, high performance computing library, which needs to be compiled into a Python module. So okay, there we're not gonna install Python, compile OpenCV into it, and then we're done. Then MySQL, set up replication, that's all tricky, right? Um, and finally, because of all that, if an engineer now comes up with the idea, hey, I like microservice, can I make a new microservice? Yeah, sure, go to your operations guy, sitting two floors below us, um, and asking him about ordering five servers, right? That's not that fun, and that's not how it should be anymore. Kubernetes is really helping us there. Um, so first of all, the resource allocation for us is simpler. We have, for all Asia, we have three servers. They run all of it. Um, it's quite well aligned, you can specify like rules like, what things should be together, what things should not be together. But you can squeeze the whole thing in Asia into three servers and it works out and um, Kubernetes and Docker will take care of isolation of these processes so that you don't get this funny eating into each other CPU spare situations. And then every service is obviously a container, which is great because then there is like not server, servers on Snowflakes anymore. You can just say, okay, I have a deploy container I deployed in any Kubernetes node I can find that has enough available resources. And for engineers, we have a set of YAML documents which are in the version control, which actually describe the infrastructure and if they wanna increase, um, increase the number of replicas, for instance, they just do it, push the changes to production, that's it. If they wanna create a new service, they copy a YAML file, change some values in there, and here you go, quite easy. And finally, what's also super nice about this, we then took all of these Docker containers and created a development environment locally so that everything, everything there is runs on a developer's PC or a laptop or MacBook, whatever, in a way that actually you can really work in, a com in an airplane ag against the running Apollo instance. For RDS and S3, it was a bit funny, but there's a lot of open source projects that can fake S3 and RDS. Aurora is actually like my, my SQL in a specific version. And I can really recommend doing that. It's, um, quite nice and way faster than working against real AWS services. Also a bit cheaper, obviously. Cool. Um, let's go to practice number two, but now a word of warning. Pedro did tell you a little lie about um, <laughs> having one place to store everything glo uh, globally, because that's not what we do. <coughs> we actually split it up into three regions. Um, we have three different Apollo clusters. One for Asia, one for, uh, by the way, I'm sorry, I tr really tried hard to draw the world. I figured out this is quite a hard job to do. <laughs> but hey, I got Europe kind of right, but then one colleague told me, who comes from Greece, hey man, you forgot Greece. And I was like, oh, oops, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> sorry for that. Um, but anyway, so we've got one cluster for Europe and Africa, one cluster for Asia, and one cluster for, um, for the Americas. By the way, an advantage of that way of drawing is actually you can draw the map in a way that your lines are straight. <laughs> which is um, quite, which is at least the one good thing about it. For, like, sharding is a super tricky topic and I cannot recommend it. However, for us, we found a really nice hack because classifieds are such a local business. I mean, when you try to find a couch, when you sit in Berlin and you want to buy a sofa, you don't care that somebody in Delhi has a sofa to sell. And even if you do care, you don't care that the image loads fast or not. It's, um, for us, we really couldn't find any single reason why we would need to have like a central brain, a central storage. On the other hand, for us, it was quite convenient to have more local servers. So we have one data center in Singapore taking care of Asia, which is just in terms of network speed, like network connectivity speed, much quicker. And we're really not getting any, any, ne any negative from that kind of sharding. So when sharding is something you consider, always figure out a fun way to, like a creative way of how can you make sharding cost very little. And we're actually getting benefits without paying a lot. We're, the one thing we need to replicate is obviously we have now three Kubernetes clusters. We have three kind of page duty alerts, okay, but that's, that's not too painful. Um, 
But then, of course, we get the high availability that each of those regions can go offline, and the others are not affected at all because they don't even know that each other ex exist. Um, going now a bit deeper into, um, into practical things, keeping your schema clean. When we all start with new applications, we have this beautiful database, and we draw nice diagrams, and everything is so simple and clean. Then requirements come in, and we add end-to-end -end relations. We add join tables. We have a lot of joins. And all of a sudden, we wonder why applications are slow. And obviously, they are, right? One thing we're doing is we try to split up our database into two, part, into two segments. The one segment being like the high load segment, and the other segment being like the lower load segment. The high load segment is the ones where we do a lot of queries per second. The lower one is like batch jobs, don't care, doesn't really matter. Not, not so important there, but for the high load segment, we'll ensure that the indexes are right, that the indexes are performing well. Aurora is a MySQL derivative. And as we all know, MySQL is a bit um, unique around index and index optimization. But really, we really ensure that everything that happens on these tables, we review. We review all the queries. We review that the queries get the, the queries hit indexes. We also check that the tables there are really cheap in terms of bytes per row. So we have like fixed, co fixed row with um, tables there. Try to not, we're completely disallowing any joins and as little queries as possible in the hot pass and definitely only one transaction for one thing. Especially when you do batch things, this is kind of usually you fall into this, okay, now I'm like, my normal request is just one transaction, but for the web batch thing, I need to call the service 10,000 times. And every time that creates a transaction, ends up being a bit funny. Um, figure out a way how to avoid that. Engineering around it is really saving a lot of um, performance, especially when performance is critical. <coughs> now then, coming from table, going to, going to ORMs. Um, Again, something really funny happens when you map out your model. And we had this one situation where we we're doing a batch job. And we thought, OK, that's very simple, straightforward. It just makes one query. And then another one to load the relations. No, actually, it was, we hit the n plus 1 problem. Because I just wanted to model uh, like a a one, one directional relation in Hibernate coming from the other end <laughs> so that the target entities would know the parent, but not the other way around, because it wasn't necessary. Sorry, no. The parent only knows target, but not the other way around because it wasn't necessary. And um, Hibernate figured out it's a great idea to make uh, 1,001 queries instead of one. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, really look at look at query logs from JPA from Hibernate. Look what they do. It's like so it, it seemed it, it seemed so logical what Hibernate was supposed to do, but still, it just came up with its own idea. And then adding that making that the direction the directional from Hibernate point of view went back to one query, uh, to, to two queries. Um, by the way, we're also really abstracting JP, um, Hibernate entities away from, from, the, from the API. So there is an object between Hibernate and the rest of the application to just not allow expose that directly, because eventually, otherwise, we end up stuffing too much business logic into Hibernate entities, whose job it is to map objects to database. And then quite often, you end up in a situation where um, you get data inconsistencies because you copy code around and forget to modify one thing when you're supposed to modify two, and not that awesome. Um, speaking about high load, for us, the most important code execution path is actually when you download an image. This happens 95 to 98% of all requests that we get are download an image. And for us, we've always taken care from, it, from the beginning on that this code path is as dumb as possible. There is as little happening as possible, especially with external systems. So when a request comes in that, um, that tries to download an image, we only touch the front-end web app. We don't do anything there. We definitely don't at all touch the database. That's clearly forbidden. We go to Thumber to fetch the image from S3 and return. Um, you know, usually, you should, like, at least the least, the least parts you, you, you involve in a request, the least can fail about it, basically. Um, even farther, there is the thing about timeouts. We've all had situations where um, websites just gone down because of something being a bit slower. So we really ensure that everything, every external thing that is touched has aggressive timeout set onto it. Um, the reason is, actually I just mentioned it, but things, some things get slow, like your database gets a bit slower, and all of a sudden your website gets down. Now, the reason why this is, is called, um, oh, I need to click here, damn it. It's called the jam theory. I know enough about the jam theory to have no clue what this is, because this is very complex math, and it's dynamic. It's a dynamic feedback loop. But basically, what happens is this. You have a highway. You drive around the highway. Everything's smooth. You're going on holiday with your kid in the back, right? 
Your kid is having a nap right now. Just five minutes ago, it fell asleep, like my son. And then all of a sudden, nothing goes anymore. And then you, you sit in the jam for one hour. Your kid wakes up again, realizes it's boring. It wants to go outside. Why are we not moving? Are we there yet? And so on. Awesome, cool. And then finally, you kind of like the, the jam dissolves without nothing. There was nothing ever. All of a sudden, you know, the car starts driving again. And all, what just happened? What just happened most likely was there was an accident, but not on your side of the lane, but on the other side of the lane. People going in the other direction had an accident. But somebody in front of you was watching a bit and forgetting to push the gas pedal right. So he was just relaxing his foot muscle a tiny bit, going for some seconds a bit slower until he realized, hey, I, need to, like, be, I can be a bit faster now. And then the people behind him also. And just because of this short thing, what happens is it causes like, exponential waiting times. You have a limited set of, um, of lanes, um, and the utilization of that lane is actually has an exponential relationship to the waiting time in the system. Same with checkouts, but also same with web apps, especially when we talk about Tomcat web apps with, um, re with connection pools or with request handling pools or like the thread-based model of processing requests. To trend from that, um, I prefer to cut off one request too early just because, I don't know, the image doesn't load from S3 in 100 milliseconds, then have, I don't know, 500 requests jamming up. Another, like another thing about this is, by the way, if you do ever load testing and you put a bit of load on the system and everything is fine, and you put a bit of more load on the system, still so everything is fine, and then you just put a very tiny bit of extra load on the system and it's gone, dead. What just happened? What happened is, of the exponential thing, you've been going here, here, and then that's exactly the point, but, and that's also what happens on the website. Timeouting everything can really save your butt. And looking at those timeouts, where is that right? So those were the six um, technical things. Now going to head over for the behavioral things as well. Thank you. So um, when you're operating at scale, it's not just about technology. It is also, in part, but that's half of the problem. If you, for example, there's books like People Wear or something like that that say what fails is people fail, right? And one of the things is take into account small things because some things are so obvious that we just ditch them out. We're like, yeah, this, this is never going to happen. And then it happens exactly in the worst time possible. That's how life goes. You know, there's karma and karma comes in and say, by the way, I don't know why karma talks like that, but... <laughs> so, breaking things is part of progress, right? It's, it is part of it. If you don't break something, you either like really good at it, and please join our company. If you break things, you're, you're just learning. It's part of it. But please also join our company. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We, we broke some things. By the way, just out of curiosity, how many, like, just put your hand in the air if you use Kubernetes or you have to deal with it. Okay, and just put your hand in the air if you ever dropped a database in a testing environment. <laughs> okay, guys, our booth is over there. <laughs> okay, I've heard production somewhere. No. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> okay, so. As I said, breaking things is part of progress. But when you are 80 years old, you're going to look back in your life and you want to reduce as much as possible regret, right? And one way to do that is taking small steps. You can still break things, but the impact is not as much as if you I don't know, for example, releasing in one small country against releasing in a real, really big country, right? The consequences are huge. So, as a, to give a real-life example, Apollo was released initially in one of our small, not so small, but small markets against, for example, releasing in India, right? If suddenly nobody sees images, you get pissed off. Like, I would get, I, would like, I, I wouldn't break my phone, but I would be imagining it, I don't know. And we are at a time where if a page takes 10 milliseconds more time to load, we get pissed off. It's true. It's true. I hope. <laughs> so, another thing is optimizing lazily. And 
it, this, is, this is actually sounds very obvious, but it's not so obvious. And recently I was talking to a developer and we're discussing the architecture of something we're developing and it's like, yeah, you know what, let's think about the caching and maybe like another layer of cache. No, no, don't introduce cache so early on in the process because you have no idea what you're optimizing. You're just like putting a layer of cache and that's it. You can think about things up to a certain point, but mm. first check how things react, how it reacts to the traffic, whatever is happening there. Employ SREs. And this is a super, this is a S for Simon, which is our SRE. We now have more people in the team. So who knows what our SRE is, by the way? Who is an SRE? Whoa. Oh God, <laughs> Jesus. I was going to throw a lot of lies, but yeah. <laughs> now I'm in a bad spot. Anyways, so SREs are not only responsible for the performance of your application, but also if you have SLAs, part of the responsibility is of them as well, also of the team, because we're a team, we're not just working individually, right? So if you have someone specifically responsible for the performance of an application, trust me, this will help a lot, especially because it's, let me give an example. If I do front end, it's gonna look horrible, and you're gonna say immediately, oh, some programmer did this right, with really weird colors. But then if you have a front-end engineer, you know, with a lot of experience and design background, whatever, it comes in and it makes it really look beautiful. And you ne I, I never knew you could make things like that. That's what happens when you hire a SRE, right? Also, he comes in, he starts, I don't know, creating these dashboards or like throwing some mathematics at you mm -hmm. and that you don't know of. I should know, mm -hmm. but I don't know. But yeah, um, so one yeah. person responsible for performance of the application is okay. really important. We had, um, before we adore Gandalf, <laughs> a good example is actually a Thumber. Thumber comes with a lot of different backends. You can go for the simple one, where you just do the image resizing in Python at a super blazingly high speed of Python. But of course, you can also compile OpenCV against it. And we are all Java developers. We are not compiling C code, right? We don't know what make is. <laughs> We'd rather not touch make. <laughs> no, actually, I haven't built this in make, but you get the point, right? <laughs> so. Um, our SRE was actually looking into, hey guys, um, Python for that sucks when you can't have OpenCV because that uses single instruction multiple data things on the CPU. And I'm like, wow, single instruction multiple data sounds awesome. And he compiles the thing and does like, arcane magic to it. And all of a sudden, that thing is three times faster, which is a system that is heavily CPU bound in terms of scaling images. This is doing math, doing calculations, calculating averages. And then all of a sudden, you get that 3x faster. How often do you get things 3x faster in a web application? Like, it's quite awesome. And usually operations engineers go for like setting up your server, ensuring that everything runs, everything recovers, and the engineers maybe they make timeouts configurable and you know, like put in knobs to configure connection pools for databases. But who actually looks at what is the right timeout, what's the right connection pool size, what's happening exactly on the database, how does like is the database able to optimize the table finally? both of those guys don't really have the time to look at. And this is actually part where SREs sitting between those really can rock and they get three, two X, three X performance improvements. So let's all give a clap to that guy at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> so another practice is to say no. And this is why we like Matthias draw Gandalf. <coughs> he has like a very pointy beard. <laughs> but uh, so saying no is also, it's hard to say no. Especially if the, the person on the other side is someone like you know for a while and you know that they're going through, I don't know, they need it and you know that they are under pressure. There's so many reasons for it to be able to say no. And there's other people that just like, no. Like parents, right? Like parents are like, no. And then you, why? Because I said no. If you say that to a client, he's gonna be like, are you on drugs? It's like, I'm just gonna like use another service provider. And we're talking about internally in the company. So say, just to give you a practical example, one of our teams uh, came to us and they asked, you know, we have this business platform and we have professional users that spend a lot of money here and what they need is a watermark for the images, right? They're selling cars, so you need to put a watermark. 
okay, sounds so far good. And they asked us, okay, so since you're providing or you're using the images, serving them through an API, can we just, you know, put their, the, the ID of the user and then we send the watermark there and then when we fetch the image, we use the ID for this and then I'm lost. What? Like, no. This is where you say no, but then you show an alternative. Okay, then you just upload the image to our service, and then through a signed request, you can actually say this image uses watermark. And why signed? So nobody can change it. You don't have the secret, you cannot change this. We actually use JWT for this. So it's, everything is encrypted inside, you, it's actually not transferred for the user, he doesn't see, actually no one cares, honestly. I don't know, maybe a cybersecurity guy actually looks at the URLs, but, but overall, if it's there, you find an alternative, you give an alternative, and clients are like, okay, it works, that's all they care for, it works, and that's it. Hmm. <laughs> and that's not, yeah. yeah. Hmm? Before we go to questions, I just wanna say thank you to, do, to those two, um, to that lady and that gentleman in the front right, <laughs> uh, front left for you, who are actually two of the software engineers making Apollo great. Um, at least if you have any, like, of course, we're going to do questions in a second, but if you afterwards want to know if we tell told the truth, maybe we put in a little like, segregation here or there. <laughs> <laughs> Go over there, ask them. Yeah. And now, do you have any questions? Yeah. If it's too hard the questions, just take us on the side because we don't mm. want to get embarrassed here. What about trunk-based development? Trunk -based okay. development. The question was, what about trunk-based development because it was written in the abstract? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we figured out this morning we have to refactor the slides. <laughs> and there they went. Yes, we're doing trunk-based development. That means every software engineer pushes to master. And we do a we do a CI run, if that passes, um, it can go to the production. We use chat ops for that, so in, uh, in Slack you get uh, information saying you could now deploy them to the production. Um, we've always done it from the beginning on, first of all, because we believe that this enforces the right kind of practices. It removes artificial safety nets, and um, like there is a beautiful website, trunkbaseddevelopment.com, where they go really in depth about what can, if you do, if you are as crazy as going push to master like we did in uni university, what can you do to make that safe? A couple of things that make that safe is programmed, like programmed defensively. So first, like if you write new code, only have it executed by a unit test, and you can commit at any time as long as it compiles. But then the moment you're done with your new code, you just make one commit that enables the new code. Effectively the same as a pull request, but you work actually it enforces test drivenness. You can um, also build a bigger safety net around automation tests. We've done that. We have quite a nice automation test coverage for what we believe is important to not break. Um, and every, like, it's, also, it's a bit of a cultural shift. It's not, it's not like you can just go and commit to production every day. There is a sort of responsibility, and people <coughs> need to know what to do. And commits need to be right. It puts a lot of, um, it puts a lot of responsibility on the commit being like following good practices. Because if you commit half-done features that break, that break production, of course it's not going to work. But if you, if, you get, if you change your mindset going like, okay, this commit can go to production, I'm building in a feature switch, I'm just going to be test-driven, this code is not going to be executed. If you have a class that only gets called by a unit test, you can deploy it to production at any time. It, you're dead sure it can't matter. Um, I think it's also giving a bit of freedom to software engineers. We don't have this review, which in many companies is a bit poisonous. At the same time, we said we want to go with a very small team. We believe in small teams being empowered to do big things. If you have a, sm if you have a big company like Google, it's awesome because at any point, at any second of the day, you have 50 software engineers who can do a code review right now for you. And they will just do just that and give you feedback and you wait 10 minutes and then, and then you get your feedback and then you can actually merge or that guy merges for you, whatever. Awesome, okay. Apollo team is right now five people and all of them are busy. <laughs> and 
And you know, wait, waiting for somebody to do a pull request is probably not a matter of minutes, rather hours, or maybe a day. And then, you know, it's not as smooth anymore. You introduce already delays when, of course, we want to go more like continuous deployment, continuous delivery. When we really go get our code changes faster production, but that, introdu that introduces another halt in the process. That's the short version. There's this awesome website, trunkbaseddevelopment.com. I can really recommend it. And we can also chat afterwards if you want more reasoning, because I have a ton of it. <laughs> and just, I just want to add something. So I was not coming from a trunk-based development, and it's quite a shift. Like mentally, it's you have to go through this change. Mm -hmm. And at some point, uh, we're like, OK, guys, we're going to switch completely from like, I don't know, pull <laughs> request, whatever, just to trunk-based development. Like, your inner self is like, oh, what? You're like, you get scared and like, what the fuck does it mean? Mm -hmm. And it's true, it's quite a big shift. You can do it, and I can tell you that after a while, it actually feels just natural. And it's like everything. There is a learning curve to everything. Any new language you learn, there's always that. But mm -hmm. after you cross that line, it actually feels great because you know you feel comfortable, and now it's your new home or whatever. So I think that's actually mm -hmm. worked out pretty well. Okay. Um, uh, how often do you deploy the new versions? Of how often do we deploy the new versions to production? I mean, Apollo, we're right now at how many times? Three? At least three a week. At three least a week. three a week. Yeah, most times we get about eight. Hmm? Eight yeah. Eight we're, still, we're still in the learning process. I think there's still a bit of a, a being scared to actually really go to production all the time, um, which is. By nature, we're all used to, you know, we have this, yeah, I have a feature branch, I can only when I merge it, and then, of course, releases are always like Indiana Jones when he tries to swap that golden figure with his sand bag. And we're all still used to it. We're trying to get, get better at that. Um, I think for next year, we're going to look at having at maximum two commits per deployment, <laughs> which is going to give us more. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to just add something also. For, for example, when you pushed, Jesus Christ, sorry. <laughs> Um, when you push to master something that happens, uh, not in our projects, at least I know one that happens, um, you push it and there is a percentage of the traffic that gets cloned to the staging environment, and this means that very quickly you get feedback. So if you break something, quick feedback, because quick feedback is also extremely important to make sure you don't push it to production, then you're like, oh God, now we have to roll back, mm -hmm. and yeah, there's consequences for everything, right? We have time for one last question. OK. I think you were first. <laughs> How do you structure uh, the database with Kubernetes and the different shards? How do we structure the database with Kubernetes and the different shards? We have three identical databases in each cluster. They, there's no shared database. It's the same database schema, obviously. We use Flyway to version the database, so we can be sure that it's the same everywhere. But they're completely like those three clusters don't know of each other. We can switch off two at any point in time. Of course, somebody will get really pissed with us. But you know, in theory, the third one would continue to work. Um, they're really all identical. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.